of a slightly different emotion this time. Uh, sorry about that. The next compilation of the bilateral theory of emotional attachment. I really isn't there, but I don't know. But Oliver Dan is going to tell us whether it is or not from Liverpool. Oliver, welcome over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, it uh, seems like a rather um, aptly scheduled uh, schedule because I'm at an, an aptly um, time question, actually, because uh, I'm going to talk about exactly that kind of point about uh, the discussion which, ri- which Richmond uh, initiates in there at uh, one point. Is that not Okay, so the topic of this paper is Sartre's description of love in being in nothingness. I argue that this, his description of love contradicts itself in noteworthy ways. In one respect, Sartre describes the capacity for love as something which is a free and existent project. In another respect, Sartre describes the capacity for love as if it were um, an essential human need. Previous readings have left this contradiction unaddressed, Yet it is to the, of the utmost importance to clarify Sartre's outlook on love, because this element of his philosophy has a reciprocal impact on the reading of his fundamental ontology. Uh, in this paper, I shall argue that when read in detail, the most coherent reading of Sartre's theory of love is a bilateral one. I suggest that the, the theoretical framework de, um, uh, necessitates two distinctive forms of love, essential and reflective. So... Um, First, I'll just provide you with some philosophical background. Um, Jean Wyatt, uh, Gavin Ray, and Anthony Hatsimoyasis suggest that there may be precedent for reading Sartre's description of emotions as implicitly establishing a bilateral theory. Wyatt suggests that Sartre's fiction critiques being in nothingness's position on love uh, by suggesting that embracing one's being for others can be a source of authenticity. Wyatt suggests that Sartre's fiction... um, contradicts the suggestions we find in being in nothingness, such as the belief that self-definition should always come from oneself and that bad faith can never be excused. Um, Wyatt asserts that the higher tolerance demonstrated in Sartre's fiction indicates the possibility of a concrete authenticity arising out of being for others. Wyatt therefore believes that it is possible to extrapolate a more rounded ontology from Sartre's oeuvre than is presented in being in nothingness alone. Ray responds to Wyatt by suggesting that the same undermining of being in nothingness can be ascertained in Notebooks for an Ethics. Ray suggests that being in nothingness's description of social relations and love is actually the natural attitude of consciousness. Moreover, Ray suggests Notebooks for an Ethics reveals the possibility for consciousness's attitude to change through a conversion process. In other words, Ray envisages a process whereby the subject would convert to an operation where the pedantic pursuit of objectifying the other ceases because they have come to recognise the other as a subject qua object for them. This conversion process would therefore facilitate the spontaneous formation of a bond of trust between beings. Um, Thus, Ray believes that love is not an impossible project but that beings can love each other as subjects who objectify each other out of pure necessity. Um, This is still only uh, limited change, uh, because many of the the limitations remain on love. For example, relationships require some tension to function, and the existence uh, and freedom of others means one cannot overcome anxiety. Nevertheless, if one converts away from one's natural attitude... Relations with others can, um, can actually take on a different significance and provide a source, uh, source of reassurance and growth. Interestingly, though, at the end of his paper, Ray questions whether Sartre is discussing the same phenomenon or whether there are, in fact, two distinct uh, types of love phenomena. Uh, this leads me to Anthony Hatsumoyasis. Uh, Hatsumoyasis responds to Sarah Richmond's chapter in reading Sartre, uh, Magic in Sartre's Early Philosophy. In this chapter, Richmond suggests that the description of emotion that Sartre offers in the concluding five pages of Sketch for a Theory of the Emotions is inconsistent with the rest of the text, and more importantly, with Sartre's picture of conscious agency. Hatsumoyasis argues that, contrary to Richmond, um, that Sartre offers... Uh, 
and this is a quote, uh, two theories of different kinds of emotional phenomena rather than analysing the same phenomenon using two incompatible theories. So there are two issues at stake in Hatsumois' response to Richmond. First, there is the question of how meaning of emotion is ascribed, uh, for which there are two options. One, where the meaning of uh, emotion is ascribed by the subject, and a, a second, where the world is revealed as a magical environment to the subject, and presumably the meaning is then ascribed from something other than the subject. This is kind of like a simplistic definition. I'm kind of uh, I'm just trying to get through the material at this stage. Um, but I think, I think the previous paper gave us a good idea of exactly what the kind of thing I'm talking about there. So um, Richmond argues uh, that the latter is inconsistent with Sartre's understanding of conscious agency, yet it remains the more philosophically satisfactory whereas Hans Moises wants to suggest that this need not be the case. The second issue at stake in Hans Moises' response is whether these, two forms of, uh, whether these two forms of love are mutually exclusive or whether they can be encompassed into a unified theory of emotion. Um, Hans Moises wants to suggest that they can, whereas the implication of Richmond's original chapter in reading Sartre is that they cannot. Um, the justification of Hatsumoyes' uh, offers, offers for this reading, um, for the compatibility of both forms of emotion, is an argument that the ostensible abandonment of consciousness from the body is in fact an act rather than a non-act. In other words, Hatsumoyes believes that when one freezes in terror, freezing is not a non-act, but an act consistent with a desire for the situation to go away. Um, additionally, Hatsumoyesis offers a quote from Sketch which suggests that Sartre was attempting to flag to the reader the possibility of a bilateral theory. So Sartre writes, There are two forms of emotion according to whether it is we who constitute the magic of the world to replace a deterministic activity which cannot be realised or whether the world reveals itself suddenly as a magical environment. Although neither Sartre or, uh, nor Hans Moises um, use the term bilateral theory, it is perhaps the case that this quote indicates that Sartre aspired to develop such a comprehensive theory. Um, we may therefore uh, keep this quote in mind when considering the argument I will sub subsequently present concerning the bilateral theory of emotion. So, my reply to current scholarship is this. I would like to argue, somewhat parallel to Richmond, that Sartre's uh, uh, latter description of emotion is the more philosophically convincing, and that this must be the basis of a Sartrean theory of emotion. So, in, in, in some ways, it's, it's kind of similar to the previous speaker, saying that there is one uh, theory of emotion, and that that kind of presupposes the, the other. Um, and so, uh, in other words, I think that Sartre's descriptions uh, specifically of love lead us to conclusions which contradict how we would usually read Sartre on conscious agency. Um, yet I diverge from Richmond in agreeing with Hatsumoyce's methodology of resolving the problem by encompassing both forms of emotion into a single and nuanced theory. Uh, furthermore, I diverge from Hatsumoyce's and Wyatt uh, as well because I do not believe that, these incons um, that the inconsistencies which I shall present in this paper can be encompassed into a comprehensive theory which satisfactorily encompasses Sartre's oeuvre. Um, in order to examine this uh, further, I must first uh, summarise Sartre's position on love. So, um, I must first say that Sartre's description of love... Um, is not a description of the ideal of love as we know it, uh, but rather it's a critical description of the concrete behaviour known as love. Um, this is to say that Sartre initiates the discussion of love purely to demonstrate that the ideal of love is based on a contradiction and that in reality there is no possibility of a genuine attitude of love. There is no possibility of a genuine attitude of love because for Sartre, the lovers require... Uh, the, the, the love ideal requires lovers to forge a fusion of their consciousnesses, yet this cannot be achieved 
because, and this is quite consciousness, is are separated by an insurmountable nothingness. To put this in even more Sartrean language, uh, conflict is the original meaning of being for others, and all relations are dominated by the problem of the existence of the other. It is clear, I hope to this audience at least, that here I'm uh, touching upon the look. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to explain this in detail here, but I will quickly... uh, say and indicate at least that um, being in a world where the look is a factor means that one is to a greater or lesser extent reliant on the perspective of the other and thus has limitations imposed upon one's freedom and to overcome this we engage in an intersubjective struggle for for supremacy in order to maintain a semblance of sovereignty and freedom yet it is not all bad news Um, The other's existence uh, can be absolved to some extent uh, because it can provide things which which would be um, beyond the grasp of a a solitary being. Whilst the other's existence is a source of disturbance and conflict, it is also a source of objective meaning and value. I, 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 I probably don't even understand the significance of using scare quotes there myself. Um, But this is because we are interrelational beings and thus lack objective self-knowledge. The only way to obtain it is through the perspective and estimation of the other. Obviously, uh, if one wants to lay any claim to being an objectively valuable person, and it is presumed that we do, um, the other's positive regard is a desirable and arguably necessary outcome. But what does this all have to do with love? Well, when it comes to strategies of obtaining the other's positive regard... Uh, Love is in a class of its own. As Gavin Ray points out, uh, this is a quote, the lover experiences a profound alteration in his being. His life gains meaning. By gaining a sense of existential importance, love makes the lover happy and is one of the main reasons why he and we in general seek the experience of love on a continuous basis. In love, we are not lost in existence devoid of an anchor, but suddenly become that anchor for another suddenly we matter and then uh, uh, Ray quotes Sartre uh, this is the basis for the joy of love when there is joy we feel that our existence is justified so whilst this description may be adequate for describing the motivation of love specifically the ideal one aspires towards in a love relationship it cannot uh, be a satisfactory Sartrean account of love itself. This is because, for Sartre, love is impossible impossible due to the other revealing the being which I am without my being able to either appropriate that being or even to conceive it. In other words, uh, one's being for others reveals something fundamentally true about oneself which is out of one's own control or ability to change or transcend. In this sense, Ray's quote describes the ideal motivation for love rather than its reality. Yet there is clearly a point to what Ray is saying, because, as Sartre explains, the whole point of love is to possess the other's freedom, so one's being for others is brought under one's own sphere of influence. Uh, So this is a, a quote from Sartre. For if, one, uh, for if in one sense my being as object is an unbearable contingency and the pure possession of myself by another, still in another sense this being stands as an indication of what I should be obliged to recover and found in order to be the foundation of myself. But this is, in, is conceivable only if I assimilate the other's freedom. Thus my project of recovering myself is fundamentally a project of absorbing the other. We may therefore say that the ideal of love is necessitated by the ontological reality, yet the same ontological reality renders the project of love unrealisable. Put simply, love is always about possessing the other's freedom, and as such, fundamentally, it is as individualistic and selfishly driven as, as it is possible to be. It is not good enough for the other to simply hold one in positive regard, The content of the positive regard must be under one's control, and love is no more than an attempt to achieve this. As Sartre writes, 
Love is, in essence, the project of making oneself be loved, a project, con and it, a project condemned to failure because, as I've already mentioned, um, consciousnesses are separated by an insurmountable nothingness and so cannot be fused to overcome the problem of objectifying the other. Secondly, to take possession of the other, uh, pos possession of a freedom strips it of his free qualities. The other must, in reality, remain free, yet for the other to remain free means that its perspective is beyond the control of the, um, the, the loving subject and subject to change without prior notice. Thirdly, the other can always choose to renege on this mutuality pact and destroy the trust between lovers um, for any reason and without warning. As if this weren't pessimistic enough, um, Sartre also denies the existence of a, a, a structural unconscious, uh, the key word being structural there. Uh, this means that lovers are aware, whether reflectively or pre-reflectively, of the pointlessness of their task. Um, consequently, not only is love impossible, but it is also in bad faith. So, to summarise, uh, for the prominent readings of Sartre, um, love is a pre-reflective project. It is primarily a matter of interrelationality and culture, not biology. And Sartre's ontology and concept of lived experience um, provides a consistent and sound basis for a theoretical model which denies that sexuality is exclusively essential or reflective. I argue that um, it is problematic to assume that Sartre's theory asserts that love is pre-reflective. I assert that Sartre's theory actually requires two forms of love to be viable, uh, i.e. a reflective and essential form. Moreover, I argue that if Sartre is forced to, uh, forced to pick a side, contrary to what we would expect of existentialism, it is the essential form of love which, which uh, Sartre's theory most naturally sits with. Um, so in order to examine this further, um, I must uh, take some examples of Sartre's text. Um, so, in terms of essential love... Uh, Sartre speaks of the relational principles which ground love as natural in the sense that he refers to the necessity to engage with the other as an obligation. He writes, uh, For if in one sense my being as object is an unbearable contingency and the pure possession of, my, of myself by another, um, still, in another sense, this stands as an indication of what I should be obliged to recover and found in order to be the foundation of myself. But this is inconceivable. Uh, this, is, this is conceivable only if I assimilate the other's freedom. Thus, my project of recovering myself is fundamentally a project of absorbing the other. So, in other words, one has a natural inclination to desire to recover oneself from the other, because the fundamental desire of consciousness is to become uh, a being for itself, in itself. Uh, so, one can only recover oneself from the other by possessing their freedom. Yet, in order for the other's perspective to retain positive value, one must attempt to absorb their freedom as a freedom through love. Um, therefore, and this is a quote, it is only by a sort of abbreviation that we speak of the desire for something, i.e. the other qua love object, rather than desire for a totality of being. Um, so I must clarify at this stage, what I'm, what I'm saying is that Sartre does want to suggest that love and sexuality are fundamental to consciousness. Um, so that Sartre indicates this, by suggesting that conscious beings are sexual from the very moment of consciousness. He writes, as soon as there is... I'm sorry for the continuous quotes, but um, it's necessary to make my point, I think. As soon as there is uh, the body, and as soon as there is an other, we react by desire, by love, and by the derived, at derived attitudes which we have mentioned. Our physiological structure only causes the symbolic expression on the level of absolute contingency of the fact uh, that we are the permanent possibility of assuming uh, one or other of these attitudes. 
Thus, we shall, uh, we shall be able to say that the for itself is sexual in its very upsurge in the fact of uh, the, the other and that through it sexuality comes into the world. So this quote certainly indicates that conscious beings are sexual by their nature, but it doesn't satisfactorily demonstrate that Sartre believes that sexuality is unavoidable, uh, unavoidably primary and uh, evident in all subsequent attitudes towards the other. Um, we do need to establish this to approve of the supposition that being in nothingness regards sexual strategies and desires to be natural conditions of consciousness rather than freely chosen reflective or pre-reflective projects. So for this, I must provide a more lengthy quote, uh, and I apologise again, um, but I, I, like I say, I do think it's necessary for me to, to, to make my point clear. Um, obviously, uh, we do not claim that all attitudes towards the other are reconcilable to those sexual attitudes which we have just described. If we have dealt with them at considerable length, it is for two reasons. First, because they are fundamental, and second, because all of men's complex patterns of conduct towards one another are only enrichments of these two original attitudes. All, con uh, all concrete conducts towards the other include, as their skeleton, so to speak, sexual relations. This is not because of the existence of a certain libido, which would slip in everywhere, but simply because the attitudes which, have dis, uh, which we have described are the fundamental projects by which the for itself realises its being for others and tries to transcend this factual situation. Naturally, this does not mean that these different attitudes are simply disguises borrowed by sexuality, but it must be understood that sexuality is integrated in them as their foundation and that they include and surpass it just as the notion of a circle includes and surpasses that of a rotating line segment. One of those extremities is fixed. So, whilst this lengthy quote may be uh, complicated to fully unwrap here, um, we can take it from, from this example and the, and the two ones that I presented previously that love is at least I want to suggest that Sartre believes that love is inevitable as a fundamental response to the ontological need to recover one's being from the other. But in order to have confidence in this reading, it is necessary to look at some further examples which demonstrate Sartre's tendency towards implying that love is essential once again. So um, one such example is the suggestion that love is the only viable means of recovering oneself from the other. For Sartre, it is, uh, it is a given that being for itself uh, wants to be uh, being for itself in itself. Thus, being for itself attempts to recover its transcendence from the other. It has not been unassailable, however, to suggest, uh, to, to read Sartre as insisting that love is the only viable means of doing this. But he, he does provide a good basis for, for such a claim. He writes explicitly that my project of recovering my being can be realised only if I get hold of this freedom and reduce it to being a freedom subject to my freedom. Whilst we understand that Sartre uh, asserts that love is an impossible project, he, he, does, he does imply that love occupies a privileged position, despite the fact that it is impossible. Uh, love at least tries to appropriate the other's freedom as freedom. Whereas other means of recovering oneself from the other are wanton in their desire for, uh, and this is a quote, a passion which flows forth mechanically from the other in accordance with their total enslavement. Um, such strategies are inferior uh, to love because they aim to destroy the other as subject from the beginning. Whereas the lover at least attempts to keep the other as a subject intact and only fails subsequently despite their efforts. So we can take these examples as an accumulated base of evidence which suggests that there is an essential human process which inevitably ends up 
in some loving engagement, provided uh, one is brought into contact with the other. Right, it's obviously a very key uh, bit on the end of the sentence there. So, in other words, Sartre suggests that uh, the relationality of consciousnesses is so important they actually imbues an essential property of an ensemblematic drive towards love in all beings. However, we may not so easily draw this conclusion because Sartre does describe love elsewhere in an ambiguous way, uh, in a way that, that could, be, uh, could be read as being more typical of how we would usually read Sartre on emotions and freedom, ag- agency, etc. So such examples don't necessarily support the essential reading of love, which I've so far demonstrated. But I hope you will agree that they do not necessarily bar the essential reading of love either. Uh, One example is uh, where Sartre writes that the unrealisable ideal which haunts my project of myself in the presence of the other is not to be identified with love insofar as love is an enterprise, i.e. an organic ensemble of projects towards my own possibilities. But it is this ideal of love its motivation and its end, its unique value. Love, as a primitive relation to the other, is the ensemble of projects which I aim at, uh, at realising this value, or be, by which I aim at realising this value. So, uh, by describing love as an enterprise, an organic ensemble of projects and a primitive relation to the other, Sartre obscures his reading of love. By locating the significance of love external to a singular project, Sartre hints that we may not be dealing with uh, a straightforward um, reflective or pre-reflective project, but something more fundamental. However, by describing uh, the enterprise of love as organic uh, and primitive, Sartre is alluding to the possibility of it being slightly out of of the control of a being for itself. At least there is the implication that love is not entirely a reflective project and functions to some extent subliminally. Of course, this is an ambiguous example um, which, only ten- which is only tentatively indicative of Sartre's standpoint and I certainly want- wouldn't want to base um, a reading of, of Sartre purely on this and, and the ones that I've previously presented. So despite this, um, it may help to consider the other ambiguous extracts from uh, Big and Nothingness which indicate a more uh, reflective reading of love um, and in so doing we, we may establish the likelihood of a bilateral theory of emotion. And I just say I'm just, I'm just going to try and get through a couple of examples very quickly just because I'm trying to give not a comprehensive picture but, a, but a, as close to comprehensive overview of, of how Sartre describes it uh, love in, 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 in being nothingness as possible. So Sartre, Sartre writes, Love is th- therefore can be born in the beloved only from the experience which he makes of his alienation and his flight towards the other. Still, the beloved, if such is the case, will be transformed into a lover only if he projects being loved. Thus it seems that to love is in essence the project of making oneself loved. This ambiguous passage uh, at least demonstrates the conditionality of love. We can see that love um, can only come about uh, if, if being for itself makes very particular choices in response to its alienation. Of course, if Sartre describes love in such a conditional way, it behoves us to lean towards a pre-reflective or reflective reading of love, at least in this instance. So we are therefore left with an interpretive problem. I have presented reasonable examples which indicate that Sartre conceives of love as essential. Whilst the standard reading of Sartre is that love is, uh, is, is pre-reflective, a reading for which we have only found ambiguous support in Sartre's text. Uh, if we accept the examples I've pre- uh, presented, we are left with two competing descriptions um, of love. One where it is essential and one where it is reflective or pre-reflective. I question, however, whether, whether the interpretive problem necessitates that we pick a side and limit ourselves to one interpretation or another. If we remember the quote from the beginning, uh, we may be able to consider Sartre's competing descriptions as two sides of the same theory. So once again, 
Sartre wrote, There are two forms of emotion according to whether it is we who constitute the magic of the world to replace a deterministic activity which cannot be realised, or whether the world reveals itself suddenly as a magical environment. Moreover, there is some suggestion in being in nothingness that Sartre's ontology requires a bilateral theory of love. Sartre indicates that conscious beings have a, and this is a quote, a pre-ontological comprehension of this deception, of the, this deception is given in the very impulse of love. Hence, the lover's perpetual dissatisfaction. So, if, uh, if awareness of the deception of love is pre-ontological, it follows that awareness of love and its necessary structures would also be pre-ontological. Um, uh, humans would be essentially relational beings. So I therefore suggest that Sartre presents a bilateral theory of love in being in nothingness. One side uh, is the preontologically derived form, which is essential to human consciousness, and the other side, uh, this, pre -re this reflective type, which is driven by conscious projects. Moreover, I assert that Sartre requires both forms of love for his overall ontology to function, and that contrary to what one would expect from Sartre and existentialism, it is actually the essential form of love which is primary. Indeed, we may go so far as to say that the essential sexuality of conscious beings is a, is a pre-ontological limit on the freedom of the Sartrean subject. Uh, as I have said, I, I am not saying that love cannot be reflective, or even pre-reflective, as has hitherto been the prominent reading. However, I am saying that Despite the explicit primacy of existence in Sartre's theory, he actually requires an essential form of love for his text and theoretical model to be coherent. Nevertheless, the important matter is that uh, in his writings on love, Sartre may not have been discussing a single and unified phenomenon, but rather two phenomena, one of which is unexpectedly essential to human consciousness.